of this. Um, so when we have the bird here, um, the biggest thing you can do, the best thing you can possibly do for any kind of animal with a pox lesion is time. Because the body will heal, it will produce antibodies, and it will beat the virus. Now, you need to wait until the body produces those antibodies into, uh, until it actually takes effect. So you need to provide supportive care along the way. And that's exactly what we did. Um, we used vitamin A, um, which is great for skin cells. It actually sort of increases the integrity of the outside of the skin cells, and so makes them a little bit more robust to the virus um, as it's spreading. Echinacea, um, there's been some wonderful studies out there showing that echinacea will actually increase the ability of some of your white blood cells in your body to go and attack viruses and bacteria. So uh, you can't take it every day, and this doesn't. This is not just for birds, this is for any, any critter. Um, you can't just take it for every day, it's called pulse dosing. So you treat it for two or three weeks, and then you stop for a week or two weeks. And then two or three weeks on, two or three weeks off. And that gives it, that way your body doesn't become used to it. Um, iodine, very important because it actually keeps down the bacterial infection that's going on the outside of the beak. So um, whenever we had the bird out of the, um, out of the cage, we took a little bit of iodine and sort of rubbed it around the area to prevent further infection. And then antibiotics, antibiotics were given inter for um, just basically to keep the, um, um, or we could have used them and did use them as, from time to time whenever a bacterial flare-up sort of occurred. Lots of fluid thera therapy, especially initially and immediately following surgery, and that's just to keep the blood pressure up. Uh, supplemental heat was very important uh, for this guy right directly after surgery. And anti-inflammatories, again antibiotics, any fungal medications. There's some, um, the common bread mold, you know, blue stuff that grows in the bread in the back of your fridge, really, really dangerous to birds. Um, and it's everywhere, we're breathing it right now, we're, we're breathing in millions of spores as we speak. And um, so it's out there, and our bodies essentially have an immune system that's, that's knocking all these spores away. However, when you bring a wild bird into captivity, and their immune system it gets stressed out, so it begins to sort of fall down a little bit, those spores that they're breathing in can take effect and start growing in the lungs. And um, the, the respiratory tract on birds is incredibly important. It's very, very sensitive. Uh, because they do all this high-powered flying and everything, they need to circulate air through their body very quickly, and they're much more efficient at breathing than, than any mammal is. And so, with the antifungal drugs, we are trying to prevent that infection from occurring. Uh, antiviral medications, um, we were able to order uh, one of these in. It was a human antiviral drug in order to, um, uh, we were trying to basically beat off the pox virus and help out the immune system. And that, that lasted, um, you know, it, I sort of go back and forth on this one whether it worked or not, um, because uh, the thing fell off at about six weeks, weeks, which is about the time that the immune system should take in, into effect. Um, so what happens if we didn't get that antiviral medication? Would it still have been six weeks, or would it have been longer? We don't know, um, but it's something just to, to keep in mind. And then also hand feeding. Our rehabilitation staff here did an amazing <coughs> job, uh, essentially going and making sure this bird had enough food. So, if they had not taken him out of the nest and left him there when he had lived or died. He would have died. Yeah. But yeah. so he was too young to have any... Essentially, he could have... Um, okay. You might want to repeat the question. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the question was, um, if, if we had have left the... or if the bird had been left in the nest um, and not taken into the wildlife center, would he have lived or died? And the answer is he, he would have um, eventually died. And it could have been from a number of different causes. It could have been from... Um, as that mass got larger and larger, uh, it could have... Um, Bacteria could have gotten on it, and then it spread to the rest of his body, and he could have died of a bacterial infection. Um, the other thing is that if he had have sort of made it over that step, and the beak kept on growing, and would have been more and more and more and more crooked, he wouldn't have been able to eat. We know right now we're treating his beak and, and sort of dremeling it back to um, the proper point um, where he can eat, usually every six to eight weeks, a little bit, eight, eight to ten weeks now, actually. And so um, if we don't do that, we've noticed that he has trouble eating. Um, and so that's going to be something that he's going to be have to, have to keep up for the rest of his life. Will his parents have stopped feeding him? Um, did this guy have another nestling up in the same nest, or was he only one here? Yeah. yeah, the parents would have kept trying to feed him. They would. Have. Yeah. Well, for a while. Yeah. yeah. We had a chat um, discussion about hand feeding. Um, we were getting him chopped up, nice rats and whatever. And, you know, it came from fish feeding, and we were wondering why we weren't feeding him. Fish. fish, sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, Well, eagles are um, eagles are notorious scavengers, notorious scavengers, and they will eat absolutely anything. Um, of the eagles that we get through here, we certainly know it, notice that there is a dietary preference depending on where the bird comes from, and it doesn't always hold true with what you might believe. 
Um, some of the eagles that we get from the eastern shore will not touch fish. Um, no, they will not touch it. Um, for the first week, and then they'll turn on to fish, and then they'll stop eating fish and turn on to rats. So it's, we, we basically offer them a, a varied diet and trying just in order to get enough nutrients into them. Um, the other side of that is we, we get, we have lots of fish here, um, um, which I believe was also another donation from, from the people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, and then the, the rats and mice we also get um, donated as well, and so we, we sort of offer different things from time to time just to see what they like, try to expose them to different things, um, because these guys travel. Um, just as a slight aside, um, there was a, um, there's a study being done right now with golden eagles in the western part of the, um, of, uh, the state, and they put a GPS tracker on one last year, and just to see what, you know, where this guy went. And within a week, he was at the northern part of uh, the most northerly tip of Quebec. So he had traveled from Virginia all the way. <laughs> the next week, he was in Georgia. <laughs> wow, so, they fly fast. Wow. They, they, they just travel, and, and bald eagles are no different. And during the, the nesting season, they'll stick to sort of a territory and such, but after the territory's gone, after they've had their nest and the nestlings have fledged, they travel. They're looking for food. So, so one, of, one of the other issues there, too, is, um, and Dave, you'll have to help me with this, after fish have been frozen, there is a certain nutritional component that uh, degrades uh, after the fish been frozen for a while, and uh, so diversifying the diet. I mean, it's be like eating Twinkies all the time. Uh, you know, eagles, eagles are notorious for eating fish, but as Dave pointed out, um, they, there have been some study here in Virginia that had developed a specialty for water turtles. And uh, Dr. Mitchell Bird from the College of William and Mary, who's now retired, but he started the Center for Conservation of Biology. <laughs> and was the chairman of the Eagle Recovery Project in Virginia for many, many, many years. He told the story about one eagle that had figured out how to use its beak like a can opener. He could open up a water turtle so fast that turtle never knew what hit. And that's all he needed. Uh, yeah. 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 That, that uh, nutrient was actually uh, vitamin B. Fine. <laughs> um, I recall that the pox fell off and it was not found. Um, mm -hmm. Did he eat it, or...? He, he, he could have eaten it. Um, we know that the... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, we, we know that the, the bedding and everything, um, we looked through that, we couldn't find it. Um, so that, that's our guess. That's okay. our guess. So. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So these are some of the x-rays, um, or radiographs, that were taken of the, of, um, the eagle, eaglet when, when it first came in. Um, there, everything is... is Absolutely perfectly normal. This is normal young uh, animal radiographs. Some of the just interesting things to point out you can see the nice thick bone structure up and down the wings, but kind of fuzzy areas around the elbows and the wrists over here, and even the knees where the bone kind of disappears. Um, that's sort of uh, uh, like the soft spot on a baby's head when it's first born. Um, it's not hard bone, and so it doesn't show up nice and white on, on an x ray. So it's made of uh, essentially of cartilage. And with time, usually in a week or two, that will harden in, and you'll see a nice bony hard structure there. So that's um, that's perfectly normal for these young guys. The other thing is that when we took the X-rays, you can see our um, this is a tube that goes into his trachea, and that prevents him from if he does happen to regurgitate his last meal or if he happens to get some fluid in his mouth, he doesn't suck that down into his lungs. So that's a safety precaution. It also allows us to mechanically breathe for the animal if they if they stop breathing on their own. And um, birds in general are notorious for that. They are under anesthesia and they just stop breathing. So he's anesthetized that whole he is, time. He is definitely anesthetized the entire time that the x rays are being taken. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, this is sort of the, the, the neck structure with the skeleton or the, uh, the spine going up and down the neck. And this great big sort of blob that's hanging here, which is hanging down here, is his crop. And so he, he actually did have some food still in his crop there. So it was, it was great that we had the tube actually in there um, to prevent anything from happening. Does the tube go? Past the crop? No, it actually, um, uh, birds are kind of unique in, in, in the sense that um, their <laughs> opening to their trachea, which goes down to their lungs, is just at the back of their mouth. It's, you can open a bird's mouth and you can see it right there. So as you put the tube in at that point and the crop um, sort of is down the esophagus and down uh, further down towards the neck. Okay. Yeah, so blocks. You, you block it essentially. Like <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yeah. How do you anesthetize them? Is it fluid with a <laughs> no, it's, or is it gas? Or? It's, it's gas, actually, and with birds, um, because they have such an effective um, and efficient respiratory system, they're very, um, they're, they are very much affected by gas anesthesia, 